Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord, the God of the Lord of hosts, and the whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And then I said, here I am, send me. And he said, go and say to this people, this is the word of the Lord. And all of God's people said, amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> if you've ever paged through your Bible, the Old Testament, you'll see that the largest book next to the Psalms is the book of the prophet Isaiah. Really, it's the largest book in the Bible because the Psalms were written by several different people. Where Isaiah is the largest book we have in the Bible that's attributed to one person. The prophet Isaiah was a towering figure in the history of Israel. It was through him that God shaped the spiritual condition of a nation. He prophesied during the reigns of four kings, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. During the 52-year reign, isn't that, a, isn't that something? Uzziah reigned over Judah for 52 years. He is the second longest reigning king over Judah or Israel during that season. Sad part is the longest reigning king that ever reigned over Israel was Manasseh, the most wicked king they ever had. And he was the longest reigning king. But Uzziah is one of the kings that it said that he followed God. And under Uzziah's reign... He subdued all of Judah's enemies, including the Philistines. He built up a strong defensive system with a well-equipped military. And I love reading 2 Chronicles 26 because he was an inventor and he invented many machines of war. Catapults and, and machines that would shoot many arrows very far. And they were mounted on the corners of the walls of Jerusalem. He equipped his army well. He developed the country economically. And of Uzziah we read, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. And then, and his fame spread far, for he was marvelously helped till he was strong. Something happens here. This is a turning point in Uzziah's life. He was marvelously helped by God until he was strong. But when he was strong, he grew proud. Pastor Jesse in the last few weeks has been talking about pride. He grew proud. 
to his destruction. In this proud and arrogant stage of his life, Uzziah decided that it wasn't enough to just be king. He's going to usurp the role of priest as well. So he went up to the temple. He entered the holy place where only the priests were allowed, and he burned incense on the altar. Azariah, the high priest at the time, and 80 other priests went in after him. And Azariah spoke to Uzziah and says, It is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priest, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Go out of this sanctuary, for you have done wrong. Well, Uzziah didn't receive this real well. He became angry. And he rebuked Azariah. And after B, and what ended up happening was, in that moment, leprosy broke out on his body. One of the most dreaded diseases of the day. And there he is. And after being forcibly removed from the temple, he spent the rest of his life in seclusion. Separated from his family. Separated from his people. Separated from the temple. His son Jotham served as a co-regent until Uzziah's death some 10 years later. And this is where Isaiah 6 begins. In the year that King Uzziah died. Following this vision, Isaiah would never be the same again. Any confidence that he had ever had in himself. Any pride that he might have had in his good deeds or his own righteousness was gone forever. It was after being under the gaze of the one who is thrice holy that he would write, all of my righteous deeds are like filthy rags. Much the same As the Apostle Paul, after his meeting the Lord Jesus on the road to Damascus, he would go on to tell the Philippians that all of his works, all of his pedigrees, all of his position were but scubalon. And the word scubalon literally means feces. Isaiah says, my righteous deeds are like filthy rags in the eyes of the one who is holy, holy, holy. And the Apostle Paul reiterated that. Isaiah saw the Lord. This is one of these passages of Scripture that I've been reading for over 40 years. And it's one that deliberately demands us to stop and slow down and try to sense in some way what's going on here. Isaiah saw the Lord. He saw him on his throne. He saw him high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled all the space around him. And smoke was filling the temple. Flying over the head of the Lord were the six-winged seraphim. They're kind of strange creatures, aren't they? Six wings. And they're crying out to one another. And if you go to the book of Revelation, they're still crying out to one another the very same thing that they were crying out when Isaiah saw them. And what is it they're crying out? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And upon that, Isaiah says, the whole place, the the floor under his feet began to shake. When the temple filled with smoke. And at the very same moment that Isaiah had this revelation of the God who is holy, he also was given a glimpse into the abyss of his own heart. And his response was, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Woe is me. 
Woe unto you. That's the prophet's cry. And if you read the rest of Isaiah after this, about 20 times he spoke the woe is you to other people and to other nations and unto his own country of Israel. But here, he literally cries the prophet's doom and judgment on his own head. Woe is me. Here, He's desperate to avoid the white-hot gaze of the one who is holy, holy, holy. This phrase is known as the trisagion and is the only place in Scripture that an attribute of God is elevated to the superlative. The Bible tells us that God is love, but it doesn't tell us that he's love, love, love. The Bible tells us that he's a God of justice, but it doesn't say justice, justice, justice. But here we serve a God who is so other than us, so far removed from us, that he is the one who is holy. 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 And if we could get a better picture here, what I believe is going on here is Isaiah is writhing on the floor of the temple, praying that the roof will cave in and hide him from the gaze of this Holy One. Like I said, he was never the same again. I don't know how long he sensed his lostness in the presence of utter and absolute holiness. But however long it was, God did not leave him there. He did not leave him writhing in his misery. And we read, then one of the seraphim flew to me. This is first person now he's talking about. This is Isaiah. He he, he was there. We're, We're talking about eyewitness. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. This coal was so hot that even the seraphim could not handle it. He had to use some tongs to pick up that coal. And then he goes to Isaiah, and this is incredible, and he touched my mouth. Isn't it interesting that probably one of the most tender spots on all of our body is our lips? Can you imagine A red hot coal against the prophet's lips. And then the angel said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. And your sin atoned for. Right there we get a picture of the whole gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Sinful man confronted with the holiness of God, which in turn identifies his lost condition. And upon recognition and confession of that lostness, another is sent to atone for the sins of man in our behalf, namely, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I cannot read this passage without thinking of the song we sang this morning. John Newton's wonderful, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. And I don't know what you know about John Newton, but you need to read about John Newton. John Newton was the captain of a slave ship. He would travel to Africa and pick up loads of slaves and then take them across the Atlantic and deposit them at the various places in the British Empire where slaves were working for the empire. The stories of what they did to slaves in that passage and the way they had to live and the abuses they suffered. John Newton said he lived with 20,000 ghosts the rest of his life because he came to the Lord Jesus Christ and became a minister of the gospel the last part of his life. And here he says, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. And at this point, he got a look into the abyss of his heart as well, and he said, the saved 
a wretch like me. Years ago when I was pastoring in Moab, Utah, a singing group came to our church and they sang this song. It was beautifully sung, but they said, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a soul like me. And I pulled the leader of that group aside right after the service was over and said, You missed that one by a country mile. Because John Newton wrote what John Newton wrote. John Newton meant what John Newton meant. And brothers and sisters, I don't believe that until we see and recognize ourselves as totally lost, that we can ever be totally saved. My dear friend Leonard Ravenhill said to me one day, Wayne, Jesus did not die to make bad people good. He died to make dead people live. And we were all dead in our trespasses and sins. And the sentence of hell was upon us all. And the wrath of God was upon us all. And it is through the Lord Jesus Christ and his substitutionary vicarious work on our behalf that we can now then enter into the presence of God as Isaiah did, forgiven and clean and whole. Which brings us to one of the most amazing scenes in all of Scripture as far as I'm concerned, and it's this. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am. Send me. And he said, Go and say to this people, and you're probably saying, you think that's one of the most incredible scriptures in all the Bible? Yes. And I'll explain why. You see, a few verses ago, Isaiah was writhing in his sin before the holy, holy, holy God. And by the mercies of God, his sin has now been forgiven, atoned for. And so complete, stay with me here, so complete and so perfect is this forgiveness that that same man who was longing to be hidden from the gaze of the Holy One, he hears a conversation going on. Who will we send? Who will go for us? And all of a sudden Isaiah rises to his feet, and he says, here I am, send me. And upon the heels of that response, then came the go. And I believe and want to share with you this morning, I believe that it is the go that is the call of every person who has ever been born again. The Psalms are replete with it. My mouth will tell of your righteousness, of your righteous acts, of your deeds of salvation all the day. So you hear, here's, here's the redeemed ones. My mouth is going to tell of your righteousness, of your righteous deeds, of your salvation all the day. For that, their number is past my knowledge with the mighty deeds of the Lord, I will come. I will remind them of your righteousness. Who's the them? It's the unredeemed. It's the lost ones who need to hear. It is the ones that are pre-cross. They haven't come. They haven't heard the story. And how are they going to hear it? They're going to hear it by the ones who know the story. He goes on and says, My lips... There's that lips again, the place where the coal touched. One day, all that came out of these lips was profane. And because of the master's touch, that which is holy can now come forth. My lips will shout for joy when I sing praises to you, my soul also which you have redeemed, and my tongue will talk of your help all day long.
It was the Apostle Peter who let us know in his first epistle that this telling is the true vocation of every man and woman and boy and girl that has ever been born again. And he said, but you, I want you to know this is not talking to those around you right now, it's talking to the person sitting in your chair, the person that's filling your shoes and wearing your clothes this morning. Are you with me? You. But you, we are chosen individually, and then God gathers us together collectively. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. And then we stop right here. Because here comes the big, the big climax. That you, same you that was in the first line, may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. My friends, 1 Peter 2 and 9 is the great purpose verse of the whole Bible. Do you want to know why God has given you the gifts of life and breath and being? Why he has placed you on this earth and redeemed you by the blood of his Son? That your life might be a living and breathing, walking and speaking proclamation of the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Or as one old hymn writer put it, to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. To proclaim, to go and say, to tell those around you the good news of Christ and his saving grace. The psalmist put it this way, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And that's not a Sunday go to meeting say so. We can come in here and say so all day long. This is a say so that follows us into our homes and into our jobs and into our schools and into the arenas that God is allowing us to occupy day in and day out. Jesus put it this way. You are the light of the world. I want you to turn to your neighbor and say to them, you are the light of the world. Okay, this half of the room, I want you to look over here at the other half, and I want you to join me in saying to them, you are the light of the world. One, two, three. Okay, everybody over here, I want you to look over here. Join me, one, two, three. You are the light of the world. You! You! You are the light of the world. And then Jesus goes on and says this. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. You ever drive through the Nevada desert toward Las Vegas after dark? You think those lights have just got to be over the next hill. And you drive for another hundred miles. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under the basket but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house in the same way. Let your light shine before others so that they might see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. You are the light of the world. And when you leave this place week after week, is it with a basket over your light? Or is it with a light that is allowed to shine forth in every arena you occupy between Sundays? You are the light of the world.
if you are a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, this is your true vocation. You are the light of the world, and you have been called to proclaim. That which you do to put food on your table, a roof over your head, and shoes on your children's feet, is secondary to this vocation. That which you do professionally is your avocation. But if you are a born-again child of God, your vocation is proclaiming the excellencies of him. Your avocation is how you keep body and soul together. God is at work beyond these walls. And he has called you to partner with him in his work. You have been uniquely chosen to tell his story. And if you read the book of Ephesians, he said he chose you to be part of this work before the foundation of the world. Dare I say this morning that if one of your heroes from the world of sports, entertainment, or politics knocked on your door this afternoon and asked you to assist them with a project and help them get the word out, that you would jump at the chance. And don't tell me you wouldn't. My friend, the one knocking on your door today is the king of all kings and the lord of all lords, the creator of the cosmos. And he's asking you to join him in his work. Remember when I told you that verse back a little while ago was one of the most incredible verses? That here's sinful man writhing in his sinful misery before the gaze of a holy God. He's forgiven, he's cleansed, his sin is atoned for. And later, when God is saying, who will go for us, that same person stands and goes, ooh, 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 ooh. Here I am. Send me. You see, the wonder here is that God takes sinners and he redeems them. Then he enlists them to be part of his work. He gives them a unique calling and a unique gifting. Jesse shared from this pulpit a few Sundays ago about how his children want to go out and help him remove the snow and how for the most part they were just in his way and it took him longer to do it but the thing was is there was that participation and that joy of a father and children working together. I'm sitting back here just about bawling my eyes out during that message because I remember my father, I was raised on the farm and, you know, nothing went to town to get worked on. It all got fixed at our house. I can remember my dad taking, I've got my hand on a, on a bolt and I'm my other hand on a wrench and I remember my dad laying his hands over my hands and saying, this tight, this tight. I remember one day when he was in a hurry and he needed to change the oil on his pickup and rather than grab the shop creeper and slip under his pickup, he shoved me under there and handed me the wrench and asked me to take the plug out of the oil pan and I'm down there for longer than it should have been taken and my dad wants to know what's going on and I said, this thing just keeps turning. I had stripped all the threads out of the oil plug. I learned that day, righty, tighty, lefty, loosey, And I have never forgotten it since. And my dad had to crawl under there and take the whole oil pan down, knock out the plug, rethread the hole, and buy a new oil plug and put it back in. But you know what? He didn't kick me out of the shop and say, go play with your sister. I learned something that day. And there were many times that he called me into his labors and it could have gone a lot faster and easier if I hadn't been there. And I think about God calling you and me. (laughs) Oh, man. Yeah, amen. Calling the likes of us. 
he could do a lot better job with a, with a band of angels. He could do a lot better job. But you know what? He calls you and me, the redeemed ones, into his work. And more than once, he said, Wayne, 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 Wayne. Righty, tighty, lefty, loosey. <laughs> and he picks me up and dusts off my britches and says, follow me. Come and go with me. Come and speak for me. That's the miracle. It's not some celebrity standing on your doorstep saying, hey, I got a project going on. You help me get the word out? It's the king of all kings. It's the Lord of all lords. It's the one who chose you in Christ before the foundation of the world, and he's called you into his work, a work that goes on in here, but a work that primarily goes on out there when we leave here in just a few minutes. My friend, he's asking you to join him actively in his work. And I'm going to get in trouble here, but, you know, when you're out on the end of the limb, you may as well saw it off behind you, right? <laughs> this relationship that you have with God is not just a private relationship. In fact, if you'll search your Bibles, you'll never find any place in your Bible that says that Jesus is your personal Savior. It's not there. It's not there. Now, I understand the sentiment between, about that because Jesus is that friend that sticks closer than a brother. He is my all in all, okay? So I get that. But we live in a day and age that takes personal, and it's kind of like personal pan pizza. There's just enough for me, but none for you, Marlo. And you know what? Some of us in this personal relationship with Jesus, we act just the same. It'll be a cold day before some of you ever open up your lips outside of this room at your job site or in your family or at your school or whatever and say, do you know? And share with them the wonderful words of life. We wonder sometimes where's the joy in this walk that we have and sometimes I think that joy is not there because we're not being faithful to our vocation. Proclaiming the excellencies of him who brought us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And that is an out there work. That is an out there work in our homes, on our job sites, in our schools, in the arenas that we occupy between the Sundays that we gather here. You see, the world's included. It's not just that he's my personal savior. There's enough to go around, Deborah. Did you know that? I can share him, and I'm called to share him. The world outside this door is included, and like Isaiah, every born-again believer is called to participate in what God is doing. As Isaiah responded, we are called to respond. Here am I, Lord. Send me. And then the Lord says, go. Go and say. Tell the world outside of these walls who I am. Tell them who I am. Tell them what it is I have done. Charles Spurgeon says, when you are saved, you are called to share the good news with others. When you are saved, you are called to share the good news with others. Don't hold back. Tell your friends at church first. Join them in worship and fellowship. That's what we're doing today. And then proclaim the good news in every place. Who is the light of the world? Yeah, very good. You, you got it, Sharon. Who is the light of the world? How, let's make it a little bit more personal. Who is the light of the world? I am. I 
I am. I am. On Sunday mornings, we gather together for worship, fellowship, and to be equipped for our vocation. The vocation of proclaiming the good news to a world outside of our door. And between our Sunday meetings, we are sent out with our hearts made right before God, with our minds informed with God's plan for the world, and with our wills charged with the response. Here am I, Lord. Send me. Here am I, Lord. Send me. What a privilege. The creator of the universe has not only saved you, he says, come with me. Be part of what I am doing. <clears throat> That's good stuff. And it ought to thrill us to the core of our being. Let's pray.